right, good evening, friends. It's good to be with you. We are talking about tonight the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the Holy Spirit and his person. If you missed that, I would encourage you to catch up on that. Uh, so we're continuing in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 12, and if you have a Bible, you can turn there to follow along. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And some Christians are uninformed and make mistakes when it comes to the Holy Spirit and his gifts. I tend to think of two types of churches that make mistakes when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've been to one of these types of churches. There are some that are very stuffy and dignified and respectable, and they do not talk about the Holy Spirit or his gifts. You don't really hear that thing mentioned at all. Uh, and then there are other churches where it's all about the Holy Spirit, and it's hooting and hollering. It's like the wild, wild west. Keeps you on your toes, uh, but maybe it gets a little bit out of control. Maybe you've been to a church like that, or up until now you have no experience with a church like that. We want you to be informed about these things and understand a little bit better. So I want to give you a few categories for types of Christians and how they approach the gifts of the Holy Spirit first. First, there are cessationists. Say, cessationists. That's a theological term for people who would say the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. Uh, ceased, And they would say they were for the apostles and the Christians in the early days of the church to help them get things going and kind of jumpstart things. But now today we don't need that any longer. It's not for us. So here's a, an excerpt from a Bible commentary. One guy who's a cessationist, he said, With the possible exception of faith, I don't know why he picked that one, all these gifts seem to have been confirmatory and foundational gifts for the establishment of the church and were therefore temporary. So there are smart Christians who hold this view. They love Christ. They're saved and going to heaven, but they believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. Now that's interesting because there are many places in the New Testament that talk about the gifts of the Spirit. You see the early Christians using them and operating in them. So if the gifts have ceased, the burden of proof would be on cessationists to show in Scripture that the gifts have ceased. So how would they show that biblically? Well, they have a verse, a brief passage that they use to prove that. There's one place. It would actually be in the next chapter, chapter 13, verse 8 of this book. Here's what it says. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will Cease, as for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Okay, so this is a passage of scripture. It does mean something, and we have to interpret what it means properly. It does communicate that there will come a day when the gifts of the Holy Spirit will cease. The trick is we have to figure out when that day is. The clue is, it's when the perfect comes. Now, this is where a cessationist would disagree with me. They would say, well, the perfect, described here, refers to the canon of Scripture, the Bible. And they would say, and now that we have the Bible, we don't need the Holy Spirit's gifts any longer. Because God downloaded our book, it's our manual, uh, so we don't need those gifts any longer. We've got the Bible. And I would tell my cessationist brothers in Christ, you're wrong. You can go to heaven and be wrong. Did you know that? Because we're not saved by being right. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. Thank God. Okay. You might wonder, Pastor Ryan, are you wrong about any theological positions? Maybe, but not that I'm aware of. Okay, I'm going to show you that they're wrong by just continuing on in that same chapter a couple verses further. In verse 12, it says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, in the King James Version it says it this way, we see through a glass darkly, but then, referring to when the perfect comes, we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been known. Okay, so the gifts will cease. When? When the perfect comes. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Now I see through 
a, a glass dimly. It's like I'm looking through a smudgy window and I'm trying to see what's going on, but then I'll see face to face. Okay, so think about this. We have the Bible now, and we're so grateful for God's word. It is such a gift to us, and we trust in it. Um, and, and it does reveal God's plan to us, right? It reveals God's plan of salvation. It reveals so much truth. But do you know everything? Even having a Bible, do you, do you feel like you know God's full plan? I don't know about you, but I don't know everything. I know enough. I know, I know how to be saved. I know that Jesus is coming back. I know what he wants us to do in the meantime. But I honestly feel like someone who's looking through a window like, I, I, I know, I think I see what's going on in there, but I got a lot of questions. Okay? Um, but then we shall see face to face. Wait a second. Face to face. That sounds like a person has a face. That sounds kind of personal. Um, the cessationists think the perfect refers to the Bible, but I, I know someone who is a person who is perfect as well. When the perfect comes, I know a person who is perfect who told us he was coming back again. When the perfect is referring to when Jesus comes back again. Now, see, that makes a lot more sense because now we walk by faith, not by sight. Then when Jesus returns, we will walk by sight and we won't need to walk by faith any longer. Uh, then we won't need the gift of healing any longer because we will be healed, right? Then we won't need God's gifts any longer because we will be with God, right? Here's what it says in Acts chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will will dream dreams. Peter preached this message on the day of Pentecost when God's spirit was poured out. The people were cut to the heart and they asked, what must we do to be saved? Which by the way, if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian and you haven't been forgiven by God for sin and you're carrying the guilt of your sin and you're wondering, what do I have to do to be saved? This is the answer. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise is the promise of salvation, the promise of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings. It's for all who are far off. That refers to time, including us today. And we see the Holy Spirit's gifts used all throughout scripture in Luke 10, 19, Acts 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 13, 19, 21, Ephesians 4, Galatians 3, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, and 1 Thessalonians 5. So the cessationists take three verses and then interpret them incorrectly to argue the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. And when you meet a cessationist, you need to be nice to them, okay? Just look at them and tell them, bless your heart. <laughs> but you're ridiculous. Okay, that's okay. And then here's the next group I want to describe, the continuationist, the begrudging continuationist. They would admit the gifts of the Spirit have continued, but they act like cessationists for all practical purposes. Now, some of you have been to churches like this, and um, they would say, yes, theologically, the gifts of the Spirit still have continued. They're not cessationists, but they don't really talk about them, and they don't really operate in them, and they just kind of keep those things pushed to the side. And so for all practical purposes, it's almost as if they're no different than cessationists. Functionally, there are Christians who would admit the gifts of the Spirit are still for today, but they're not really interested in them, and they're definitely not eager for them, maybe because they're scared of them, and they don't really see the need. Like, why do I need that? And if I'm being honest, I kind of sympathize with why they would not see the need as easily today. Think about it. We've come pretty far in the last 2,000 years. Think about 2,000 years ago, 120 people in the upper room in Jerusalem, desperately waiting for God to pour his spirit out, facing the threat of persecution and death, knowing that if God didn't pour his spirit out, they were hopeless and likely facing a painful end. Now here we are, millennia later, on the other side of the planet, 
on the other side of the Great Commission, we've got it pretty good. A nation established on the values and principles of Christianity. We've got buildings. We've got air conditioning. We've got indoor plumbing. Our kids have bounce houses and video games in their ministry spaces. We've got laws that protect our freedom of speech and our right to worship God. We have police officers on campus, but they didn't come to arrest us. They came to protect us. So... We got it pretty good. No wonder there are Christians today who are like, well, why do I really need the Holy Spirit? Can I just tell you this? If you haven't discovered the need for the power of God in your life, it's only because you haven't discovered the purpose of God on your life. Because once you really try to live for him, you're going to realize you can't do it without all of him. Then I want to describe the group that I would label as charismatics. A charismatic is what I would call a continuationist, but with a, a, the right attitude. They would say, yeah, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I'm grateful for them, and I'm not embarrassed of them. Let me talk about that. People think about the word charismatic. If you applied it to a normal person, like you know, an actor, it would be a positive attribute. Like, man, they're, they're magnetic, and they're likable, and they're, they're talented. But when you apply it to a Christian, it brings all kinds of negative baggage and a lot of negative stereotypes, doesn't it? You think of charismatic Christians, and you tend to think of people with big hair and too much makeup. <laughs> so what does that mean? Where does that word come from? Uh, it comes from Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 12, the chapter we're in, verse 4, it says this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. That word gifts in Greek is the word charisma. And it literally means gift or free gift. Well, all of God's gifts are freely given. They're not earned. We don't deserve them. But we receive the good gifts of God because of his grace through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, so if you were to ask me, hey, you know, Ryan, are you charismatic? Are you Calvinist? Are you a Baptist? Are you Pentecostal? Are you one of those Arminian? People ask me these questions all the time. And I can't give you satisfying answers. I'll just tell you that right now. Not because I'm trying to be slippery, but just because those labels are not good classifiers. I can't fit into those categories very well. But I'll tell you, is this church charismatic? It depends on what you mean. Does it mean that our women wear too much makeup and have big hair? Does it mean that we only care about feelings and experience and we care about those things more than doctrine and God's word? Then no. But if, if by that you mean that we believe that God has given us good gifts by his grace that enable us to do ministry for the glory of his name, then yes, we are gifted Christians by God's grace. We're all charismatic. Praise God. Spiritual gifts are not the same as your natural talents. Natural talents are things that you were born naturally good at. Maybe you were born with a good voice to sing, you were good at math, you were born athletic, and you might use those gifts to earn a living. Maybe those gifts or those, ta those natural talents made you famous, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Those natural talents came by birth, but spiritual gifts come through being born again. And we start to read about them in verse 8. It says, To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues, all these are the work of one in the, same, um, in the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. In verse 28, it goes on to add teaching, helping, and administrating. In Romans 12, it also mentions prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, and mercy. So I'm going to briefly define these gifts. These are my definitions, doing the best I can to sum summarize them and simplify them for you because I did a quick survey and saw that about half of the people who responded said, I have no idea which spiritual gifts I have. So I wanna help you identify how God might want to use you and understand these better. We're gonna move through about 17 of these spiritual gifts quickly. First, a message of wisdom. This is a divine answer, insight, or supernatural solution 
to a problem or conundrum that you might be facing and not know how to solve on your own. Doesn't that sound pretty good? Like, I don't know what to do. I have no idea. I Googled it. How do you fix this problem? You know, what, what should I do? I watched YouTube videos. I still can't figure it out. I asked all my mentors. I still don't know what to do. But then God gave me supernatural wisdom and it clicked into place. That sounds helpful, doesn't it? You see this with Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. God gave him supernatural wisdom. There were two women fighting over um, who uh, this newborn baby belonged to. And one was saying, that's my baby. And the other said, that's my baby. And Solomon, God, God gave him wisdom. He said, I know what we'll do. We'll cut the baby in half, give one half to each woman. Like, who thinks of that? <laughs> one woman said, fine, I'll take half the baby. And the other woman said, no, 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 no. <laughs> give her, give, just give her the baby. And obviously that revealed who the true mother was. That's the wisdom of God. If you have the gift of wisdom, people probably come to you for advice because you have demonstrated wisdom and you would make a great counselor or coach or advisor. Then there's the message of knowledge. It's specific information that could not be gained by natural means. This is God telling you something you couldn't know otherwise. My dad experienced this. He was a pastor, and he believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he was not weird. You can take it from me. <laughs> and he shared this story. Back in the day, pastors would stand on the stage during worship and just kind of worship up in front of everybody, like, I guess being a good example. And uh, he was on stage one day during worship, and the Lord spoke to him. There was a couple in the church who, they were older. They were trying to have a baby. They couldn't get pregnant for years and years and years. God spoke to him. The Lord spoke to him and said, go tell Linda to buy diapers. And he was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and he, the Lord was like, tell her to buy diapers. And he said, that's crazy. And the Lord's like, do it. So he walked up to her and he's like, the Holy Spirit wants me to tell you to buy diapers. <laughs> that's like, and she went home and took a pregnancy test and she was pregnant. And that was... Another guy in our church last week told me his family was financially just broke. They were getting their water turned off, didn't know what to do. God gave him specific direction to start a business uh, in a field he had no experience in, uh, specific guidance. It blew up. They got awards. They're hiring employees. It was it's been completely prospering. Like, where did this come from? Well, God knows everything, and he can share that knowledge with you. Then there's this gift, discerning of spirits. This is the ability to discern whether a message, messenger, or spiritual manifestation is godly or evil. Uh, you see this in Acts 16, where Paul and Silas encounter a slave girl who has a spirit in her, who gives her the ability to tell the future. And she follows Paul and Silas around saying, these men are servants of the most high God. Now, that could be confusing, right? If you met someone who could tell the future, you might be like, well, tell me my future. But Paul had the discernment of this spirit to know it was not a good spirit. It was an evil spirit. It was a demon, and he cast it out of this girl. It was good for her, but it upset her master, and he had them thrown in prison. But this gift is very beneficial. Let me just point out, it's not called the gift of discernment. It's not a general gift of discernment. People will sometimes say, I have the gift of discernment. And usually they're just critical people with a critical spirit. <laughs> and they don't, they're not, it's hilarious because they're not even discerning enough to notice that there is no gift of discernment. And they can't even discern their own critical spirit. But we need this gift today because there are many deceptive spirits in the world who are subtle and clever. And God says in the last days, many Christians will be led astray and deceived. So we need that. Then there's prophecy. It's a message inspired by God that equips, urges, or comforts his people in the present or for what will happen in the future. Okay, so this is a message from God inspired by him to his people. And it's just right on time. It speaks to his people. It encourages them. It urges them on to do what's right. It builds them up. And, and oftentimes it's for what's happening right now. Occasionally it, it might be as to what will happen, but usually it's not predictive. More often it's for the present. And I, I saw one person get confused. They were, they were confused. They, th they said, you know, prophecy can't be for us today. It was a cessationist. 
And he said, prophecy can't be for us today because if it's inspired word from God, then it would be scripture and we would have to add it to our Bible like an addendum. And I was like, bro, that's so silly <laughs> because we've never, we've never done that. You know, there's been prophecy happening throughout the entire church age. You could go back to Acts 21. There was a guy named Philip. He had four young daughters who prophesied, it says. But we don't have a book in our Bible called Philip's Daughters. Because not all words of prophecy are equal in authority to the canon of Scripture, right? But you have experienced, on a regular basis, prophetic revelation. If you've ever been, like this happens all the time, uh, I'll, I'll preach something and people will come up to me and say, did my wife talk to you? And, and I'll be like, no, what are you talking about? Like, how did you know that? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. You, you, your sermon spoke to exactly what was happening in my family. Oh, I didn't know that, but God knows what's happening in your family, and he can speak to what is happening in your family. He has that ability. Then there is a message in tongues. It's a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. The word tongues means language. People get freaked out by tongues. They're like, tongues, oh, like, that's so weird. But it just means language. Uh, and I'm going to talk about tongues in detail in a couple weeks, so I won't get really into it right now. But uh, this is a gift for the body, and it is different than the ability to pray in tongues privately, which is available on a widespread basis. Um, this is primarily a gift which is a sign to unbelievers, chapter 14 says. So we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Then there's the gift interpretation of tongues. So if a message comes in another language, uh, it needs a translator. All right? This is the ability to understand and express the meaning of a message in tongues. We'll talk about that. Uh, then there's the gift of teaching. It's the ability to communicate complex truth in a simple way that others can understand and apply with confidence and joy. So if you've ever sat under teaching that comes from someone who's not gifted in teaching, you know it. Because as soon as it starts, you can't wait for it to end. <laughs> right? You're just like, punch me in the face, knock me out, wake me up when this is over. But when someone's gifted in teaching, you're like, I'm learning. And I like this. And I know how to apply it to my life. This is great. Uh, God gives people in this. And we need people who are gifted in teaching in all departments, in kids, in teenage ministry, and with newlyweds, and with young moms, and in men, there's all kinds of opportunities for that. Then there's the gift of encouragement. It's the ability to speak words that comfort, build up, and strengthen others, sometimes called the gift of exhortation in some translations. This guy walked up to me last week and he said, Pastor Ryan, I don't want to give you a big head, but that sermon wasn't bad. That guy does not have the gift of encouragement, okay? It's like I was not encouraged. So, like, but there are people who are really encouraging, and they're just, and here's the thing. It's not flattery. They're not giving you fake compliments. The gift of encouragement is a God-given ability to speak life to people in the way that they need and to sense the areas in people where they are discouraged or spiritually dry and need to be refreshed. And when you get around people like that, it just puts wind in your sails, it charges your batteries, and you leave feeling like you could take over the world, right? And you might have the gift of encouragement, you might know you have the gift of encouragement, if people always come to you when they're going through a hard time. You're like, why do, they always, why, why do people always call me when they're going through a hard time? I don't know why, why I'm the one they, go, they call when they're going through a hard time. Well, it might be that you have the gift of encouragement. Or they know that you're a gossip and they want to just, you know. <laughs> so you can pray about that. <laughs> then there's a gift of leadership. It's the supernatural ability to guide, influence, and inspire others in the right way to go. The word leadership, it literally means guide, and it communicates the idea of steering a ship. One of the ways you know that you have the gift of leadership is that people will follow you. So people will be like, I think I have the gift of leadership, but then nobody will ever follow them. So, 
There are people with different capacities for leadership. Like in Exodus 18, Jethro tells Moses, appoint some men to lead 10, some 50, some 100, some 1,000. You might lead in the boardroom. You might lead on a team. You might lead in a ministry. Uh, You could even be a leader in today's world, I think, on social media and influence people as to the way to live, the way to go. People who are gifted in leadership don't just tell other people what to do. They show them how to do it. They lead by example, and they demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit as they lead. They cast vision. They show what can be, and we need godly leaders. Then there's the gift of administration. This is the ability to manage and direct resources, people, and systems for optimal outcomes. These people are good with X's and O's. You've got the gift of Microsoft Office, spreadsheets, data, systems, operation, and game plans. You see a mess and you want to organize it. You get a mission you can't wait to plan it. Sometimes these people are gifted at leadership too, but sometimes not. They make great accountants, assistants, executives, uh, and even homekeepers. Like my wife has the gift of administration. Uh, Like her idea of a good time is making a list and organizing the house. Like she made this list yesterday. And our daughter went to grandma's house, and I was finishing up my sermon, and my wife, she just put in an audio book, and she spent hours going around the house and just checking off lists. I mean, she even, like, dated the list. Like, I don't know why she had to date it. Uh, I have not made a task list, y'all, in 20 years. But to my wife, making a task list is her idea of a great time. And if she gets out the label maker, whoo, it's a party now. I came in, she watched, she's like, let me show you this. I reorganized your underwear drawer. It was, and it's amazing. Like it makes our household better. She uses this gift to bring order to our chaos. People with the gift of leadership and people with the gift of administration need each other to cast vision and then execute the vision. And you see this in scripture, like Joseph, he was thrown into slavery, but everywhere he went, he was raised up to manage and administrate. In Potiphar's household and in Egypt, God used him in this way. You can read about that. Then there's the gift of faith. It's a supernatural confidence that God will come through. All Christians do receive faith from the Holy Spirit. God gives you faith to believe in Jesus, right? You didn't work up that faith. Otherwise, you could take credit for it. God gave you faith to believe. But then there are some people who have crazy faith. Even when other people give up and go home, they're still believing like the Energizer Bunny. They're still out there like, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. I believe. And it's not like unrealistic optimism. They just really believe the promises of God. They believe in the power of God. They know in their heart God can, and they believe he will. This is a blessing to the body of Christ. And I love in the example of Numbers 13, how God sent 12 spies into the promised land. And two, two, you know, there was was a really different thing that happened. 12 12 spies go into the promised land. They come back. Ten of the spies gave a negative report. And they said, there are giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers compared to them. We are doomed. Okay? Those are the people with the gift of realism. The gift of Debbie Downerism. You know what I'm saying? But two of the spies were named Joshua and Caleb. Do we have anybody here named Joshua or Caleb tonight? Yeah, yeah. Named after people of great faith, right? See, history doesn't remember the people who were pessimistic. History remembers the people of God who had great faith. Okay. Two of the spies said, no, no, don't fear. God is with us. We can take the land. And their attitude was like, It's a good thing that they're giants, because when we win, we're going to have even more stuff to take from them. It's awesome. See, we need the gift of faith in the body of Christ, because when the church goes through persecution, when there is suffering, when people are doubting, people with the gift of faith can bolster the faith of other people and hold the line. God can can do it. God's going to come through. Then there are gifts of healing. It's the supernatural impartation of health. This gift is unique. In the Greek, the word gifts is plural on this one uniquely. Gifts of healing. These are gifts that the Holy Spirit has. They're his gifts, and he distributes them. And it's different than the others in some ways. So, like, 
individual persons in the church, like we're, we're not individually healers. So like you're, you're not going to be like someone who's empowered as a healer. The Holy Spirit is the healer. Usually what will happen is God will give you probably a, a gift of faith to pray for healing in a, spirit, in a supernatural way. Um, but really any of us can and any of us can experience the Holy Spirit's gifts of healing. And that's a good thing because if it was just individuals who had gifts of healing as, as individuals and you couldn't get to that person, you'd be in trouble. But all of us can get to the Holy Spirit. So you can pray and ask God for healing and receive healing, amen, whether it's physical or mental or emotional healing. And you do know, by the way, that all of us will be healed by God. God will heal every sickness and every disease. It's just a matter of when. Will it happen when we enter eternity or will it happen supernaturally now? But either way, I can say, God, I believe that you're a healer. I receive healing. I thank you for healing. Uh, whether it happens now or when I step into eternity, I'm grateful. I trust you, and I know you're good. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Then Scripture describes the working of miracles. These are other types of divine intervention that changes natural circumstances. So think about all the things in Scripture. God parts the Red Sea. He feeds uh, the 5,000. Uh, people walk through the fire, but they're not burned. God ca calms the storm. He raises the dead. The sun stands still. You can pray and ask God to do the impossible. Usually people with the gift of faith, it will accompany gifts of healing and, and gifts of miracles. It's really just praying and saying, God, would you do this impossible thing? I know you can. I know you can. And we believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Can you just hear me on this? God did not retire from the miracle business. He didn't say, yeah, you know, I just did that for my autobiography, and then I retired, and now I'm just, I'm not doing that stuff anymore. He still does miracles, so we should believe for those today. There's the gift of giving. It's an ability to steward and then joyfully give resources for the advancement of God's kingdom and benefit of believers. This is one of the ones that was mentioned in Romans that I described. Now, just like every Christian should have faith, every Christian should show mercy, every Christian should give. It's a discipleship practice that we should all experience because it's part of the process of becoming like Jesus. Jesus, the ultimate giver. We want to be like Jesus. We can all give in some way. So, so nobody should say, I don't give at all because that's not my gift. <laughs> nice try. No. <laughs> but some people, they give out of a sense of duty, even though it's not easy for them. Okay, that, that's a thing. Then there are other people who have the gift of giving. Uh, and some people are really gifted at this. These people have resources, and they get more joy out of giving to build God's kingdom than just buying more stuff. They want to bless others more than they want to just buy more stuff. Now, hear me on this. The kingdom of God is not communist. He doesn't expect everyone to earn the same amount, and he doesn't expect everyone to give the same amount. He expects that some people are going to be uniquely gifted to earn ridiculous amounts of money, and that's great. And some people are going to be gifted to give ridiculous amounts of money, and that's also great. Now, whether you earn a lot or a little, you can be faithful with whatever you have, okay? Whatever you have, you can be faithful. That's what's so cool about the discipline of tithing is 10% is 10% regardless of what tax bracket you're in. Right? You can be faithful and you can put God first with tithing that way. But then the gift of giving is like sacrificial. It's above and beyond. It's generosity that some people uniquely are gifted at. And I want to encourage you in this because this group doesn't get enough uh, discipleship or appreciation in today's world. Um, don't judge wealthy people. Hear me on this. If I told you not to judge poor people, like, hey, don't, hey, church, don't judge poor people. If someone comes into church looking poor and homeless, don't judge them. You would all be with me, like in a heartbeat. Yeah, don't. However you look, come no matter what. We would all be on the same page. But if I said, 
Don't judge rich people. Someone comes to church all like Gucci'd out, bling, drives up in their Bentley. Don't judge that guy. You'd be, some of you would struggle with that. You'd be, well, shouldn't he not be so materialistic? You could feed a small country for what that car costs. Well, you might not know this, but he probably has fed a small country. See, we have people in our church, they are really wealthy, but they are also really generous. And they give ridiculous. Some people in our church are really wealthy. They fly under the radar. You would never know it. Other people are really wealthy, and you might be able to figure it out. (laughs) And they have nice stuff, but more power to them. Don't judge them. That's between them and God. They might have the gift of giving. That is a great thing. So that's a cool spiritual gift. More power to you. Then there's the gift of mercy. Mercy is a God-given compassion for the hurting and broken, coupled with the ability to demonstrate tenacious kindness towards those in distress. You're the person with a sensitive heart. You're the person, you probably cry when the animal adoption commercials come on late at night. You know, like it's like, in the arms of an angel, you can save an animal. Dial 1-800, you're like, I'm gonna call an like that's probably you. you. You care, you're sensitive, you, you just have a sensitive heart. And, and really it's for people who are hurting and broken that other people have a hard time loving. You run into the difficult situations. You want to serve in the prison ministry. You want to serve in the food pantry. You want to sit with the divorced. You want to sit with the grieving. The person that just wants to sit and cry for hours, you're, I'm there. And Jesus was like that. In Matthew 9, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion. Now, if you have the gift of mercy, you've probably been accused of being soft or a pushover. But in reality, God has gifted you with the heart of Jesus to love people who are hurting and broken and to show compassion for them. And this is the last one. Helping and serving. Helping and serving. They're two different ones, but I'm just going to put them together because I don't really know how to distinguish them. But it's the unique ability to recognize needs and sacrificially meet those needs. These are people who, they just see a need and they're willing and ready to meet the need. One of these words, the word serving, is where we get the word deacon from. They're willing to do the dirty jobs, the thankless jobs. They're just people like this. They just don't hesitate to grab a broom. They don't hesitate to take out the trash. It doesn't matter if the job is sweaty and hot and thankless and stinky. They just do it. Why? Because it needed to be done. These are the people, they don't, they don't honestly, they don't need a trophy. They don't need applause. They don't mind being told thank you, but they don't really need to be told thank you. Why? Because they get satisfaction out of being useful, out of being helpful. They just want to help. This is a gift. If you have this gift, it's so cool because the Holy Spirit is also called our helper. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve others. So if you have this gift, you're acting just like Jesus. You're acting like the Holy Spirit. And I'll just, I'll tell you this. You don't always hear thank you. Let me say thank you. Because our church couldn't function without you. All right. And I know you're out there, you're serving in all kinds of ways. I'll also say this, you don't always get thank yous and applause and rewards in this life, but there will come a day you're going to stand before Jesus. He's going to high five you with nail scarred hands and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I think in heaven, you're going to get some of the biggest rewards. All right, so I don't necessarily think this is an exhaustive list. In Scripture, there are other times the Holy Spirit comes on people and gives them supernatural gifting to build the temple, to play instruments, to fight in battle. We don't get an owner's manual, an operator's manual as to how to use the gifts of the Spirit. We have to use wisdom. We have to walk in humility. And we honestly learn how to operate in these gifts through a bit of trial and error. You might have listened to this list and you might be thinking like, well, I'm still not sure which gifts are my gifts. You'll be able to figure it out as you walk in this through trial and error. You know how you figure it out? You figure out what you're gifted at by doing this. It's the thing you do that when you do it, 
God blesses it. Okay, you know how, you know how there's some things you, you do that it's like when, when you do it, like, I did it. I got it done, but it was not pretty. There are other things you do, you're like, I did it, and I don't know how it turned out as good as it did. It's almost like I, I did it and I, I put it in God's hands and then Jesus did this thing where he blessed it and he multiplied it and he just did something with it better than I could have done with it. It's almost like God gifted me to do something I couldn't do on my own. That might be the way that God wants to use you. And then understand this, you can grow in your area of gifting the more you operate in it. You won't grow in your area of gifting sitting on the spiritual couch watching others operate in their gifting. Um, Paul told Timothy, fan into flame the gift you have been given. Fan it into flame. It might start as a candle flame, but you can fan it into a fiery flame. The more you use it, the more proficient you'll get in it. I'll tell you even just personally, I, 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 sometimes, I sometimes look back at my sermons from a few years ago, and I'm like, man, I can't use any of this. It's so bad. It's just like... It's a, but as you, as you progress over time, you can see how God helps you to get more proficient. As you let God use you, you'll grow in those areas. By the way, I think God can operate through your children and give your children spiritual gifts from a, even a young age. So watch for that. Watch for signs um, in areas where they might be gifted uh, in, in, spiritually. I think about like with my daughter, I think God, I think God might be like gifting her uh, in, in the area of giving. Like every time we want to leave the house, she wants to bring gifts for people. She wants to bring snacks to give to people. She wants to bring toys to give away to people. She wants to color pictures to give away. I'm like, we can't get anywhere on time because she's putting gift bags together for people. I was like, we got to nurture this. You got to watch for that. Okay, so this is the closing. I'm going to give you some practical guidelines here how to use the Holy Spirit's gifts. The more powerful the tools, the more dangerous they can be if you use them improperly. Amen? Amen. I mean, you take a power saw, and you, you, know, you got to watch where you put that thing. You know what I'm saying? You got to use these things properly. Otherwise, like the church in Corinth, if you don't, you get all kinds of chaos and confusion. How to use the Holy Spirit's gifts? First, in order. In order. There are some of you right now, you come from a Pentecostal background like me. Hey. You hear me talking about the Holy Spirit right now, and you are excited. You are like, oh, yeah, I've been waiting for this. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. It's about to get turned up in here. I mean, you're so excited right now. It is, it is going to get turned up. God's going to pour his power out, but it's all going to happen under control. Because God is not a God of disorder. He's not a God of chaos and confusion. He's a God of order and peace. And I've been around the block long enough to see people try all sorts of crazy things. So I can just tell you, it's not going to work here. Uh, I've seen people who get crazy and they're like, you know, I'm being crazy. And, and you're like, well, you need to stop. And they're like, I can't because the Holy Spirit's upon me and making me, making me do it. Well, that, that doesn't work. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 14. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. What does that mean? You can control it. I can't control it. Yes, it, you can. It says right there. I can't control it. Yes, you can. It says right there. By the way, I've never seen anybody lose control with the spiritual gift of giving. <laughs> never once have I seen someone try that. Never. I'm still <laughs> it's hilarious. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So we, we want all of God's power. We want all of God's power, but race cars and even rocket ships have seatbelts. Okay. The Holy Spirit does not give you license to do whatever you want just because you feel led. He doesn't give you a license to be erratic or to subvert the established authority in your life. Uh, I talked to one husband. He was like, Pastor Ryan, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to be a godly husband. I'm trying to love my wife. I'm trying to lead my wife. But she doesn't listen to anything I say. She does whatever she wants, and she just says, well, God told me. And I'm like, well, that's not it. 
Then you get people in church. This happened in the, in the Corinthians church. People doing all kinds of different things, being divisive, causing chaos. Well, God told me this, and I'm just using my spiritual gifts. And, I'm doing, and Paul had to come and lay down the law and reestablish order. And so we want to operate in the gifts, but in order. And we have to do that under the authority that God gives us. See, God gives um, leaders and spiritual leaders to the church to help us for this specific reason. One of the ways we use the gifts of the Spirit, we have to recognize is imperfectly. The Holy Spirit is perfect, amen? But we are not. We are broken vessels. He dwells inside broken vessels. So we know he's perfect, and he works through us, but because we're imperfect, that means sometimes we get it wrong. Some, sometimes, you know, you, you, you feel like you heard from God, and you want to go encourage someone, but it's like, I thought I heard from God, and I thought I had a word from God, and really, I just got food poisoning from Filibertos. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> I messed up. I got it wrong. And so when you operate in the gifts of the Spirit, you have to walk in humility and recognize the limits of your humanity. But God will give you spiritual leaders and pastors to help you in that and to guide you in that. And so you want to take advantage of it. If you don't, it causes chaos and confusion when, when you don't. Um, on, on the other hand, when spiritual leaders and pastors stifle the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, that hinders the growth of the church which is what happens in some churches, which is why in chapter 14, uh, Paul says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. That's another topic. The second thing, how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit for the good of others. For the good of others. Truthfully, I've met some Christians, when it comes to spiritual gifts, they can just become a little bit prideful and, and puffed up. Again, this is what happened in Corinth with the Corinthians. Some Christians, they walk in the room, and they're like, God's gift to humanity. Never fear, Captain Charisma is here. I'm here to save the day. I've got spiritual gifts, and I've come to solve everyone's problems. Yeah? God did not give you spiritual gifts to puff you up, but so that you could help build up the church and build up the body of Christ. If you're getting business cards printed up with your spiritual gifts on them, you might be missing it. Like, I've literally had people walk up to me in church like, hi, Pastor Ryan, my name is Tom, I'm a prophet. I'm like, well, well, Tom, this is a nonprofit organization. I'm sorry to tell you. It's like, you know what I'm saying? I believe in prophecy, but you get it. It's, we're not receiving these gifts so we can feel self-important, but so that we can serve others. It says right here in this chapter, verse 7, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common Good, right? So really, when we talk about spiritual gifts, uh, it's not about me, myself, and I. It's all about serving others, being a blessing to others, being a benefit to the body of Christ. You're really praying, God, I want to be a blessing to others. I want to serve others. I want to help others. I want to make a difference in the lives of others. That's what this is all about. I'm going to close with this, okay? Think about the classic American steam locomotive engine, the train engine we all think of. It's that classic, you know, you think about like, choo, choo, chugga, 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 chugga. That's like the train I think of when I think of trains, okay? This train is powered by steam power. Uh, a fire heats up steam, and that's what both enables the whistle to blow, choo, choo, and it's what allows the train to drive forward. This, this is the biggest steam engine ever built. It was used during World War II to haul supplies over mountains, okay? I think about some charismatic churches, some Pentecostal churches I've seen, where all you really get is a lot of whistle blowing, you know, they talk a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and you get a lot of hoo-hoo. Man, we got a lot of Holy Spirit action going on today. Hoo-hoo. And it's like, man, well, when's the last time someone got saved in this church? Well, 1987. I remember someone got saved and baptized. But we sure do have powerful services, a lot of gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, see... The number one sign that the Spirit of God is moving is that people are being saved and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. See, 
the same steam that enables that whistle to blow is what moves that train forward. God doesn't give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit just so that we can make a lot of noise, but so that we can move forward. Don't get me wrong. I don't want a dead silent church. The cemeteries are dead silent. Noise is a sign of life. But, but we want a church that moves forward, that moves the church of Jesus Christ forward. We want to move forward, reach more people for Jesus. We want to make progress. We want to be a part of advancing the kingdom of God. We want to see lives change and souls reached. We're celebrating with people getting baptized today. It's awesome. Last week, we had 83 people decide to follow Jesus. That's what it's all about, right? We believe Jesus is building his church. He's going to do it. The Holy Spirit works through us. He works in us to accomplish this mission. And we're going to talk more about it in the coming weeks. But we want to be a part of what Jesus is doing because he's called us to be a part of it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true and you're working in us and through us. We thank you for what you're doing in this body. Uh, thank you for the lives that are being changed. We, we ask for all of your spirit, God. We ask for your power and we ask for you to do mighty works for your glory, God. We thank you for greater things to come in the days ahead. We, Lord, ask that you would help us to receive your word today and understand it properly and apply it to our lives in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.